Good morning and Merry Christmas. So uh, here's part of a conversation I may or may not have heard during the break. First of all, did you get all your Christmas shopping done? All right. So uh, one guy says, uh, so what'd you get your wife for Christmas? Well, she said, um, nothing would make me happier than a diamond necklace. <laughs> oh, so you're going to get her diamonds. No, I'm going to get her nothing. <laughs> Ladies, what do you think? He wants her to be happy, right? All right, guys, uh, we still have a few more shopping hours uh, before the end of the evening. Communication is important. It's always important, I think, especially around Christmas, because no one wants to be responsible for disappointing anyone or being disappointed because of a miscommunication about a gift. Now, my wife is smart. She knows she's, she doesn't text me anything. She cuts out a picture, and she brings it to me and shows it to me. Or, better yet, if we're out shopping, takes me by the hand, takes me down the aisle, this is what I like to see under the tree or in my stocking. <laughs> and I wouldn't have it any other way, right? <clears throat> Anyone relate to that? <laughs> Guys, come on. All right. <clears throat> we've been married a long time, so that's, it, that works out that way. That's why we've been married a long time. <clears throat> All right. So saying something in person always seems to be better, and God feels the same way. That's why on Christmas morning, he came in person to give us his gift. And uh, as we can see, the topic of our message this morning is going to be the gift God gives. And our text isn't going to be from one of the traditional passages about the nativity. We're going to be in John chapter 1, if you'd like to turn there. Uh, when we speak of the nativity, we are normally thinking about uh, passages in Matthew or Luke uh, that speak about the birth of Christ and where it's seen from a human perspective. But in John 1, we're going to see it. Uh, the scene will be decidedly more from God's perspective. So <clears throat> see if I can work this. Let's start by reading the first four verses, and verse 14 as well. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. God, the gift God gives is himself. And we're going to see that in three aspects this morning as we look through this passage. And especially these three aspects are going to be uh, his word, his life, and his light. Now, <clears throat> God gives us his word. Now, when we say uh, God gives us word... We might assume that God's making a promise, because when we use that phrase, hey, I give you my word, that's what we mean, right? And in, in one sense, when God the Father sent his son, when God the Son willingly came, he was fulfilling a promise. This is because at the beginning, God promised to Adam and Eve, after they had rebelled from him uh, and gone their own way and rejected the life and light that had filled them, God made a promise that uh, he would provide a savior for them. And so he sent his son, identified uh, this morning, as we see, as the word. Now, logos, or logos, is the Greek word for word. However, the true definition goes beyond that. Uh, it means an expression of thought, uh, the embodiment of a conception uh, or idea, and it involves the use of reason. You know, logos is the word that we get our word logic from. So when the word became flesh, he came as a, a logical and exact uh, expression of God in human form. And uh, the writer of Hebrews uh, saw that as well. And here's how he starts his uh, letter. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, and in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. 
When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And in Matthew, we read, uh, and this is from Isaiah, actually, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And finally, Paul to the Colossians says, For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. He came not because he needed anything from us or he owed anything to us, but because he wanted to share his love and fellowship with us. And we saw in Hebrews 1 where uh, in ages past, God had sent many different uh, various prophets. But in the right time, uh, he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who came not just as a messenger, but as our Savior. And in his coming, we learned two truths. First, that the word is personal. Now, some say that God didn't want to get his hands dirty uh, with dealing with our sins. So he created a fall guy, another being who would do his dirty work for him. But when they say this, they miss the point. The God who created us for himself wanted to be personally involved with us and personally take on whatever it would take uh, just to restore fellowship with us. Let's see what some of the scriptures say about God's desire for us. First of all, we're going to look at Levit Leviticus 26. Moreover, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul will not reject you. I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. Now, I decided to uh, do a search in uh, my search engine, and so I put in the phrase, I myself. That's a personal phrase, I myself, and I got a lot of verses, but I want to sh share some of the ones that uh, came up that I thought would be pertinent for us today. In Genesis 9, God speaking to Noah and his son says, now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. Leviticus 20, speaking to Israel, Hence I have said to you, you are to possess their land, and I myself will give it to you to possess it, a land flowing with milk and honey. Through Jeremiah, he says in 23, speaking to Israel, he, after he had cast them out of the land because of their continued sin, this is what he had to say, Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their pasture, and they will be fruitful and multiply. And Ezekiel 34, for thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. Now, in the New Testament, we see Jesus as the good shepherd saying in John 5, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. In John 6, for this is the will of my father, that everyone who beholds the son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him on the last day. And then Luke 24, uh, right after his resurrection, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Finally, you know, listen to the heart of Jesus as he speaks to those who are, about those who are rejecting him. And he says this just days before his crucifixion in Matthew 23. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. God became the living word so that he could personally express his love and care for us. And he leaves us with his written word so that even today we can find that that, that same truth still stands. So we see that his word is personal, but it's also powerful. His word is powerful. What do we mean in this context about uh, the fact that God's word is powerful? Well, let's look at verse um, John 1, 14 again. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So what is Glory. Well, glory is the external manifestation of internal character. For instance, when we speak of God's glory, uh, we often think of this blinding brilliance that emanates from this internal character of purity and holiness, and, and it is, and it does. 
But is that what John is speaking about here, about the Lord Jesus? You know, that everywhere Jesus went, people had to, you know, shield their eyes from all this brilliance. Otherwise, they'd be blinded. Well, to be sure, there will be a day when Jesus will be seen in his full glory. And for a picture of that, you can turn to Revelation 1. Not now, but later. But while on earth, he emptied himself of this physical manifestation in order that he could perform his greater work on our behalf. Now, in the Old Testament, the word for glory means a heaviness uh, of having weight, having importance. And uh, in the New Testament, it means having a good reputation or being honorable. And so we speak of those whose opinions and insights have weight because they have proven themselves as being honorable and well-respected. This is their glory. Now, glory was seen in Jesus while he was on earth in how he carried himself and how he treated others with grace and truth. And we see the power of the word specifically in the way Jesus spoke and in the impact that his words made. For instance, in Matthew 7, we see this. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. And in Luke 4, And all were speaking well of him and were wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? Now, some might say that Jesus was just a a popular local sect leader, that uh, all his followers were enamored with his charisma. However, However, there are those who would not be so easily swayed. How did they respond? Well, for instance, there was a time when the chief priests And Pharisees were very upset with Jesus. And so they sent the officers to arrest him and bring him back. And these officers were the temple guards. Uh, These were Levites who had the responsibility on the temple grounds to arrest anyone who was causing a disturbance or um, breaking any of the hundreds of ceremonial laws, and some of them very trivial. And they would also have been very aware of, of good teaching and bad teaching, and they'd be listening for any reason that they might have that they could bring someone before the Sanhedrin and have them uh, dealt with there. And so they were told, hey, go get this guy, Jesus. Well, what happened when uh, they went to hear what Jesus had to say? And this is the follow-up on that, John 7. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and the chief priests said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. Now think about it. Their job is to watch over the temple, uh, take sure, make sure proper teaching is going on. They, they know who they answer to. Chief priests and the Pharisees sent them on a mission, and they come back empty-handed. Why? You know, For sure, they were mocked and chastised uh, because they didn't arrest Jesus. You can see that later in the text. But they couldn't find a reason to because everything Jesus said made sense. It was true. And even more, you can get a kind of a sense that they were actually listening to what Jesus had to say. This is because the power of Jesus' message was not about condemnation. It was about restoration. And that's why he spoke with grace and truth. He spoke the truth because we needed to hear it. You know, the fact that because of our willful turning from our creator, our relationship with him has been ruined. It's been destroyed. And we have become lost in our ways. So he spoke the truth. But because of his great desire for us, Jesus always spoke the truth in love and grace to let us know that he personally would make it possible to restore us, us and our relationship and our life, and that he alone could do it. And he did it on the cross. And so God gives us his life as well as his word. In him was life. What is life? Well, it's not random. His life is not random. Earlier uh, in this year, an article was written for uh, BBC Earth entitled, There are over 100 definitions for life, and all are wrong. (laughs) Now, this article, it speaks about uh, different scientists They have different ideas what it truly means. What's the definition of being alive? For instance, they say, you know, a chemist might uh, say that life boils down to certain molecules while 
a physicist will uh, put a focus on thermodynamics. You know, back in the 1850s, um, it was a lot easier to come up with uh, assumptions and postulations about life because back then there wasn't that many people that could confirm or uh, rebut it. But um, today, 160 years later, we know a whole lot more. But I think the thing that we know more about is just how much more we don't know. And the more we start lifting the layers of life and we get in with our microscopes and, and all that stuff, we see there's just so much more to find. What we do know is this, that life, as we know it, is based on carbon-based polymers. And from these polymers, uh, namely nucleic acids, proteins, and polysaccharides, virtually the entire diversity of life is built. However, Carl Sagan warned against holding onto even this truth as we searched for extraterrestrials. He referred to having a carbon-centric view of alien life as carbon chauvinism. <laughs> Just because we have it doesn't mean everybody else does, okay? So we may not be sure of a complete definition of life, but we do know its source. And because we know the source, we know that life did not just randomly happen. There is just not enough time and chance in the universe. I like um, Christian apologist Ravi Zacharias. He, take, he has a take on a familiar theorem uh, based on this kind of probability. And maybe you've heard a variation of this. This is what he says. <clears throat> if you take a million monkeys and each had a typewriter and each of them typed a letter a second, so that's a million letters a second, and they had to type 379 consecutive letters uh, from a Shakespearean quote. Take 379 letters. And they could do it uh, with no spacing or punctuation. Just get those letters in a row, the right order. It would take a million billion years. Okay, 379. Now, uh, it just so happens they say the universe is about 13.8, maybe 14 billion years old. In contrast to that, there are 3.1 billion biological letters in the human DNA that need to be in a specific sequence in order for life to occur. So how long do you think that would take to ascend them, assemble randomly? So you got 379, takes uh, a million billion years. We only have 14 billion years. And then you got 3.1 billion biological letters. And it, yeah, so that's not going to happen. <laughs> life isn't random. <coughs> And we shouldn't find it surprising that life, which finds its source in the word, is made up of letters, right? What's amazing is that the author of life took it upon himself to take on a physical body with all its frailties just to become one of us. Why would he do that? Well, because his life is about relationship. Let's look at uh, 1 John. We saw John 1. Now let's look at his... A letter that he wrote. And here we're going to see uh, similarities between the beginnings of both uh, pieces of literature. But here, notice his focus on personal relationship. And this is what John says. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And in John 17, he says of this, that Jesus spoke, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is not gained by doing. It's gained by knowing. You know, who you know, that, that's really what counts. You know, God created us to fellowship with himself. He doesn't need us, but once again, he wants to share his, himself with us and to fellowship with us. And that's why he made us in his own image. We were made physically, but to be made in the image of God means that we were given a spiritual nature. And this life is dependent of God and cannot survive apart from his sustaining power. It wasn't meant to. For example, let's say tomorrow, tomorrow morning, someone hands you this interesting package, okay? It's a gift. 
nice. And you go, wow, okay, what's in it? And you, and you go through and you go, hey, look at this. It's, a, it's an appliance. Yay. That's what, right? That's what I want for Christmas. And so, okay, uh, what is it? You know, yeah, it has an operator's manual. Okay. Uh, I'm a do-it-yourself kind of guy. I like to figure these things out by myself. Where do you turn it on? How does it work? Um, and this, oh, let me see. This cord with a plug, it keeps getting in my way. So we're going to have to deal with that. There we go. Okay, so let's see now. It, I think this might, you know, you know what we need? I need my, this is what I need. I need my trusty, I got it right here. This is what I, I apply to everything in my life, my hand crank. You got to learn how to do things yourself, you know. And I think, wait, oh, here we go. Let's see, if, can we get this thing to work? You know, sometimes, though, I think we get so carried up of trying to make things work our own self that we don't even understand what it's supposed to do or why we have it. Have you ever uh, felt life like that way? You're just so busy working, trying to make life work, you forget that an operator manual was supplied as well as a connection to power. <laughs> and instead, you just kind of cut yourself off from it. So here you are with this plug. Um, I'll have question is, once the cord has been cut, how do you get it reconnected? Well, that leads us to our next portion of our message. He gives us his light. Because his light reveals. And we're going to, there we go. Light reveals things as they are. It makes things clear. And with it, it brings understanding. For instance, tomorrow morning, the kids are not going to want to wait for the sun to come up and for the light to shine. Uh, and they won't, and they'll, but they'll have to, right? Unless, of course, they turn the lights on. But either way, they need light so they can see the packages, so they can see the names on the packages, so they can gain understanding about which ones go to them, right? Light reveals truth, and it brings understanding. Otherwise, that we otherwise might not have. And when we have understanding, we're one step closer to answering the question, what is the meaning of life? So I had that question, so I asked Google. And, um, <laughs> and in my first page, how many people ever go past more than the first page? I always just stay on the first page. All right, some of you guys. But it's on the first page, I got this uh, choice. What is the meaning of life in one sentence? Okay, so, oh. Anyone want to know what the meaning of life is in one sentence? Okay, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Here it is. A meaningful life is one that joins with something larger than they are. And the larger that something is, the more meaning our lives have. Not bad, huh? Uh, but we can do better than that. All we have to do is identify what that something larger is. Sunday school answer is? Jesus. Jesus. That's right. <laughs> Very good. Because in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Because people, when they saw Jesus and saw his life, they understood. The light of his life was the understanding that comes. When you watched him and how he lived his life and what he said, you gained uh, understanding. And it mirrors what he taught. Let's look at this. Very familiar, Matthew 22. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. And Paul continues with the same thought in Romans 13. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And in Galatians 5, 
For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. And if I had to pick one word, that would be love. This is our purpose. This is why we were created, to love and be loved. And God gives us his word and his life and his light to reveal and remind us of this truth. You know, what makes Christmas so special to me is this is the one time of year when the whole culture is drawn to practice this, right? Where we are called to set your, what you want aside and think about what other people want. You know, instead of looking out for yourself, you're thinking about others. You're looking forward to the enjoyment you'll see on the face of those you give a gift to. And then the season passes. But this is the time we can enjoy that, right? And you're in the malls, you hear the, you know, the Christmas carols, no one else hears them, but they're there. Love is a command as a necessity of life because that is how life was created to work. Because that's how God works. God is love. And life finds its source and its purpose in him. Wow. And, and it's totally dependent on him. To live is to love, and to love is to live. And when we live and love as Jesus did and see how he did it, we gain more understanding not only how to live and love better, but a better understanding of who he is and, and how to enjoy fellowship with him. And this is what Jesus was speaking about in John 14, where he says, He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Now, right away, some folks get distracted with uh, keeping the commandments part. It's like, uh, what do I have to do to attain God's love or salvation? But there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we could ever do. We have to be totally dependent on him. But what I want you to remember right now is what we learned about what keeping God's commandment equates to, right? It's the same thing. If I'm obeying God's commands, I'm loving. And so we could actually look at this verse again and look at it now. He who loves is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. See, God loves everyone. But it's only those who will love him in return that will be able to truly experience and enjoy and understand uh, the love that he has. So the question is, why is this true? If this is true, why aren't more people doing this? Why aren't more people in love with God, seeking him out, enjoying his life and love? It's because they haven't seen the light. Light must be received. His light reveals, but it must be received. See, though light shines on everyone, it's only effective for those who are able and willing to see it, right? And if we are willing, God is able to make us able. And, we've been, and when we do this, we begin to understand what this is like, especially as we continue our text in John 1. So let's do that. Uh, we're going to look at verses 9 through 11 now. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were, in, those who were his own did not receive him. Why didn't they receive the light? It's because the light reveals, you know. He, the light, reveals truth. He reveals the good and the bad. He reveals our need for God and also how we've betrayed, rejected, and rebelled against him. And that the natural consequence of rejecting life is death. But he's willing to pay for that for us, and he, and he did on the cross. Still, some folks would rather close their eyes, go their own way, and wander in the darkness, rather than try to comprehend and understand and, and deal with the one who is not only the light, but said that he was the way the truth, and the life. Now, admittedly, the life God calls us to is one of total 
trust in him. We can only love and live by being dependent on his love and his life. You know, that requires that we trust him when he calls us to love, regardless of whether we are loved in return. We do this by trusting that God will bridge the gap, that, you know, if I love you, you don't love me. I know God loves me and empowers me to continue loving you. The problem is that we're not willing to trust God to meet our needs, so we feel we've got to try to meet our needs our own way. And so in the process, we end up using it and hurting everyone around us. The truth is that every one of us comes into this life broken. We need healing, and we need forgiveness for the pain and suffering that we've caused others. But we also have pain, and it's maybe because we don't understand why God allows the things to happen to us that he does, but we know that he will give us light to understand. If we seek him and who he is, we know he loves us. We don't understand what's happening to us, but as we seek him, we gain, and how he is, we gain light and understanding, at least how to progress through the trials and pain that we might be going through. And it's all about trust. We need to receive the gift God gives, the gift of his word, his life, and his light. But how? Well, John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. He gives the, the power, the ability, the authority to become a child of God. When we believe who he is and what he's done for us and our absolute need for that because we can't save ourselves, when we believe, we will receive. What does it mean to receive the Christ, the light? Let's look at, uh, almost done, one more verse here in Revelation 3.20. It's familiar, right? Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and this is Jesus speaking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. And we see a familiar picture here of Jesus. You see, that there's no handle on the door. It can only be opened from the inside. There's no, no light in the window. But Jesus is bringing the light. You know, I think people are afraid that if they let Jesus in, he'll turn the world upside down and rule with a, a whip and a, an iron fist. But in reality... He wants to turn things right side up, and he wants to lead with grace and truth. To be sure, Jesus is Lord, but his desire is to lead you in his life and his light and his love. He just wants to fellowship, but you have to invite him in. Now, those of us who are familiar with the actual text of Revelation 3 know that Jesus actually might be speaking to a member of the church. So how does that work, you know? Someone who's attempted to shut Jesus outside. For whatever reason, they feel that God has failed them or, or he wasn't there for them or, or they've just kind of drifted away and, and put God outside. But Jesus is at the door saying, you know, let me in. I'll throw some wood on the fire and let's rekindle this relationship because that's his desire. You see, because even though they may have closed the door on their Lord, he's still on the property. Uh, his, his light in them may not be seen through the window. It may be down in the cellar under a basket. And Jesus was concerned about this. And that's why in Luke 11, he says, No one after lighting a lamp puts it away in a cellar nor under a basket, but on the lampstand so that those who enter may see the light. It's not enough to invite Christ to sit on your porch or come in and have a place at your, in your formal dining room and then leaving him there with a cup of tea in his hand while you go about your business. Brothers and sisters, are we inviting him to our kitchen table where it's a lot messier, but it's a lot closer to where the action's at? That's where he wants to be. He wants to be involved with every part of our life because the gift that God gives wasn't just meant to be given to us. He intends to give that gift through us. But for that to happen, we need to not only receive him and the light of the life that he shines and so that would shine in us. He wants us to set that on a lampstand so that it can shine throughout and all around us. And that's what Christmas is really all about. And this is the best time to do it. Amen? Let's pray.
Father, we just want to praise you and thank you for eons ago seeing our need and, and you and the Son and the Spirit communing and, and seeing uh, how this was going to go about, what needed to happen. And Lord Jesus, you came down here. You became one of us uh, to be abused by us, Lord, and, uh, and to be crucified uh, for our sin. So Lord, we thank you for doing that. And for you, you say it was worth it for the joy set before you. You endured the cross. So looking forward to the day we would fellowship with you. And still even now, you are calling hearts to yourself. Lord, help us to surrender more and more of our hearts and lives to you, that you have your way with us. Shine in us so we can really understand better who you are than to help to allow you to shine out of us to touch those around us for your glory. And Lord, we do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.